What's going on, y'all? You are listening to the Chain Reaction Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremiah Mitchell, joined once again by our lovely co-host, Jeremiah Harding. What's up, man? How's it going? That's reasonable. Oh, just a preface for the audience. I fucked up my eye somehow in a way that I don't actually still know. Um, so I'm going to be looking away from the lights that are in the room uh, to give my face that proper uh, pale fucking lighting um, that people crave so much. Uh, but I'll be looking down and away from those lights. So if it looks like I've got anime eyes, that's why. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to convert into a, a cartoon before your eyes. I don't think anyone's afraid of that, but it would be quite interesting. It would be interesting, but it would also like remove the dimensions of my personality. You know, it would probably exaggerate some others. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be pleasant. Okay, well, fine. You don't have to do that then. So, uh, I'll I'll reschedule. You know. Okay. But we'll find a better time. Yeah, if you can figure out how to make that happen next week, that would be fantastic. Yeah. All right. Do you want to give a thirty-second update on Nazi furries from two weeks oh. ago? <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, just uh, there's a site for for us ter- terrible Nazi furries uh, at this point that got built up by uh, Bluemere Wolf on Twitter, um, and he's also that over there as well. Um, and uh, it's called FurriesSpeech.com. And it's dedicated to saying what we would have said elsewhere if the SJWs hadn't blacklisted us there. Um, it's still weird to me that I'm that I'm included in that. I think Stefan Molyneux was actually removed um, from the list of Nazi furries, um, but oh, for some it's reason, he's so bald. Like, you know, yeah, you with I all mean, your hair obvious. makes you look like you might always be wearing some sort of bad furry costume. Yeah, right? right. Like it's a natural fursuit. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you that's... were born. You were born to be a Nazi furry. Shame well, with, and, shame and, that you have that birthmark in the shape of a swastika, though. Oh Too yeah, bad. definitely. You, you know, it, it, it's sort of um, <laughs> it's sort of interesting because I've got the opposite facial patterns of Hitler. He's got like the little it in the middle, and I've got oh, like the thing it's on missing. the side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You. I mean, not missing, but you just have a little more. On the edges there, yeah. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't notice that. You are the you are the anti Hitler. Yeah, I got I got the hair. I'm 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 advocating for you know peace and anarchy rather than ethnostatism. Fucking well, I'm okay. I'm advocating for violence that leads to peace, which you know I think I think that is a subject for another time. <laughs> Yeah, it's in, it's interesting. I think it's uh some people have this definition of violence. I think I think it Mark Passio it started with or at least he might yeah. be the big originator. Yeah, I I I get it. Um I know what that is. He uh but he talked about how his definition of violence is that defensive force is not violence. Violence is only aggression. Yeah, so but he's wrong. Like yeah, I I agree. I agree. I mean but we spent a lot of time as anarchists trying to clarify word meanings and kind of changing and shifting word meanings and getting in all these uh, very nuanced discussions about what we mean when we say X. So it's it's perfectly reasonable for the in the context of particular conversations to specifically define violence as one thing and then it's at least understood by both parties. I don't necessarily agree with that definition, but it, it uh, I don't know any, anything I'm peeking out my audio here. So I'm going through the settings, try to change it. I appreciate mm. just trying to think about that stuff a little. I know it's just, I, it seems like a pussy's way out. It's like, I'm not going to be violent. Oh, but you just shot that man. Oh, but yeah. that wasn't violence. I, I, I would never I be you. violent. Yeah, there's a lot. God damn about, it. There's a lot about Passio that I'm not quite sure on. Obviously, I have a special place in my house or in my heart, not my house. Maybe my house, but perhaps not. For anyone who doesn't advocate for aggression, 
Like I'm like, ah, you know, don't like that, but at least at least you don't support violence against me. That's a step in the right direction. Well, unless it's not violence violence. <laughs> right. The initiation of force. But I thought you initiated force. So that thing where I cut off your arm, that's totally chill. <laughs> yeah. I just uh it just bothered I've I've sort of promised somebody um well I've promised them without the spit this time um that I'll be doing a, a DTube video on that uh, subject on on sort of rebutting the entire Mark Passio lecture thing that everybody posts the YouTube link to where they're like oh a, but it's an a awful bunch of them violence Oh, that yeah, one but in there's particular. one speech he gave at the hotel thing, and it's like what everybody posts. And so I'm going to respond to that because I think that that's pretty much all I need to respond to. Because honestly, if if his entire framework is based on that particular thing, and I can disprove that particular thing, then I've sort of like you know Boston Tea Partied his cargo cult, and that would make me smile. I. I don't think his entire framework is that simple, though, is it? I've only watched. A well, I mean, bit. that's the basis for a lot of it. You know, okay. it, I mean, th that that's the reason why he calls certain things uh, aspects of natural law, because they aren't, quote, violent, even though they very clearly are to like bear scrutiny. It's like, right. oh, but it's not violence. That's uh, that depending upon how you define you. define violence. I mean, I just, I don't like that, because if you, if you say that violence is somehow, like, just the things you don't like that are, that are forceful, um, you know, then that could basically mean that people could finagle their way out of being non-violent, even though they do a lot of very violent things by conventional uh, understanding yeah and I, that's not going to do anything to advance anarchy because people are going to see violent people saying they're not being violent and they'll just think we're fucking insane i i agree i think we should adhere to whatever the sort of standard generally understood definitions of words are in as much as we can you communicate right. the message for sure you violate my boundaries i'm gonna violate the fuck out of you yeah I'm I'm probably not, but I will request that you stop and then we'll go from there. Um Well, I'm saying violate as in violence. If I, I, if they no, I, if they accidentally I trespass, I don't really call that a violation. It, like if, if if I don't have a sign and they like like they're they're going for a jog and a drop of their sweat lands on like the the, the right centimeter on my property line, that's not violation if but if they come on my property with a gun and say i'm not leaving then that's a violation and i'm probably going to do something violent to them yeah I, you even, know even with that i've i've been punched and shoved and the like and i've just asked people to stop to be As fair <laughs> you have a religion that says that it's much better to turn the other cheek and to not let them control you by making you more violent than God would want you to be. So there is a little bit of an ideology there. And it's a respectable yeah. one, yeah, but prioritize. it is the ideology. Prioritize love. But I, in all those cases, let me just be clear, I, I was willing to throw down <laughs> if necessary. Yes. So, I mean, it's just uh, try to choose. Well, if you don't have a sword, necessary. sell your cloak and buy one. Yeah, pe yeah peace generally leads to more peace depending on the circumstances in in many human relationships most people when actually confronted with the opportunity aren't aren't that interested in having violence done to them and doing violence to others that don't want it so sometimes just stopping and pausing and inviting people to think through whether or not they would like to continue down this path it results in them Stopping. Uh, no, I guess I'm not that interested in it. It's uh, having just a, a decent human intera interaction is better. Also, we didn't say this. I was, I don't, I don't know what's wrong, you guys. I think I keep updating this program, and then it keeps changing settings around on me, so I keep having audio issues. 
That way you need to adjust right before the show. But we are going to have Shane Radliff on today to talk about prepping and survival as a general topic. I don't know specifically what we're going to talk about. I'm just trusting Harding. He's got a, a list of questions ready. <laughs> Make my day well, easy. Well, he's pretty much going to say what he said on Moment of Rage, only okay. more concise. Because he came onto my program um, two weeks ago. And uh, and we discussed uh, survival and prepping, generally what to do. Um, and he also discussed, I think it's called the Marinea Project, because uh, he's involved in a seasteading project that's new and designed for sustainability and shit. Um, and it's also not depending on, you know, government treaties to thrive. Um, so it's, you know... It's it's he he has a lot of interesting things to uh, discuss, and uh, and I'm basically gonna let him uh, have at it because the the like the framework on my show was a little bit more inquisitive directly, but yeah. a lot of the questions were answered there. So if anybody's interested in a more in depth in discussion that isn't a, a guest spot on this podcast, then they can go check that out. It's about an hour long show done. Oh, Actually, it might have been t- three weeks ago. It was something. Um, I'm I'll link sure. to it on the show notes page at time to free dot us. You can just search for probably yeah. thirty seven, and that'll put you right to the episode page. And then you can click the links if you want to listen to the show. So remember to send me that after. Is he? Is he ready? Yeah, no problem. It's uh, technically our time. Yeah, he's ready. All right, you want to bring him on? Yeah. He- and and by the way, um, for the listeners' benefit, uh, there was a there was a scheduling conflict that was my fault. So uh, he's been very gracious to massively move it up during the day. So uh, thank you, Shane, if you're listening right now. Um, yeah, I'm we going can't to call remember. him, and we. Sh- you, you just go call him. Yeah, we can't remember what time the show starts anymore because we're dealing with different time zones and times are hard and we keep changing it all the time because i have scheduling conflicts because once you get a kid schedules just don't work out as well as you hope that they will yeah well you know i mean and 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 i just have this weird extreme sudden need Need for cash because I'm possibly moving to New Jersey. So, like, there, there is, there's a possibility that it, like any of these things could be canceled if I can get significantly high-paying work. Um, right. But you know, um, it, it's. I think adults have to get used to like schedule changes, and it's you know really fortunate that we have somebody who was as even keeled about it as uh, as Shane was, which I think he's on now. So uh, thank you for uh, showing up. Uh, massively early shane (laughs) not a problem i appreciate the invitation so um i already sort of gave you an introduction um i think actually what would be most interesting to start with because i you know we have an anarchist audience um so the i think the survival and prepping uh, would would be something interesting, uh, definitely for this cast. But I think what would be most interesting is if you could give us like a, a five to six minute rundown of the Marinia project. I think that's what it was called. Yeah, yeah. So, so unfortunately, as of now, there has been an update since the last time we talked, and the Marinia project is on hold. Uh, Bob uh, Bob Llewellyn, the project manager, was you know funding all of that out of pocket, and after a year or so, uh, with uh, you know limited growth. Uh, he de- so we de- he decided to you know put the project on hold. It's not it's not done, uh, but it's on hold. But yeah, the Marinia project is a uh, seasteading venture uh, that was slated to or that is slated hopefully uh, to set out in the uh, Quezal Bank, which is in between the Bahamas, Cuba, and uh, Florida. Uh, there in that kind of uh, in that little triangle area, and uh, the the phase one was basically uh, the idea was to get a barge or a flotel. Uh, and this is where well, this is where the two projects. I'm sure you, you I'm sure you've heard of the Seasteading Institute. This is where the two plans kind of diverge. Um, Marini is going to be using, or uh, so hopefully is going to be using uh, already existing technology. Uh, whereas the Seasteading Institute, they're coming up with all of this architecture, uh, these really grand schemes from scratch. So uh, as far as simplicity, uh, Marini is you know worlds ahead. I would say uh, in that. Uh, so the the phase one would basically be just a uh, it's. Uh, 
It's called a Flotel. So it's, been, it's a barge that's been repurposed to be a hotel. Uh, it's very luxurious. And the idea is to put that out in the water and, uh, you know, start with that. And then at that point, we'd be able to, uh, there'd be a lot of profit making venture uh, out there on the water. So outside investing wouldn't really be that big of an issue at that point, uh, which also kind of differs from uh, the Seasetting Institute, at least uh, to some degree. Uh, so the, that's kind of the Marinia project. It's a seasetting venture that, uh, you know, hopefully will take place out in the Quezal Bank. I uh, definitely recommend your listeners go ch- look that up on a map. It's a very, very interesting area. Uh, but yeah, that'd kind of be a brief rundown of the Marinia project. Shane, what's the cost of uh, something like that? I'm sure it's gotten to the point where they've figured out kind of basic costs, right? For the bar- original just barge, hotel, right. flotel. Right, yeah. Yeah, so the flotel, the f- uh, phase one is $15 million. So I that's mean, the, not, the not price. Not bad. Mark. No, that's, I mean, it, it's yeah. still a lot of money. Reasonable. Sure, yeah, a ton of cash, but yeah. it's reasonable. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at some of the, even some of the sea setting projects back in the 60s and 70s, they were spending hundreds upon hundreds of, upon hundreds of millions of dollars. So $15 million, that's realistic. <laughs> that's really realistic compared to some other, uh, I guess, uh, prices I've seen in the past. Yeah. W- was there a plan to do something similar to what the Seasteading Institute is trying to do by getting permission from local nation states to be able to float in particular areas and have this business? No. Okay. No, no, no. Cool. no. Um, so, so the Seasteading Institute, yeah, they have a hosting nation state, French Polynesia. Yeah. And the idea with the Marinia project is to be in, interna- in international waters, but still within the exclusive economic zone. Of, uh, of a country, and they, just real briefly, the exclusive economic zone is the area, I think it's like 237 miles off of uh, the, uh, the seafloor, the atolls, any sort of land, any sort of resources on the ocean floor. Uh, within that 237 miles, uh, nation states and countries already have claimed, uh, claimed ex- the exclusive economic rights to those. So if it's a floating village, it's seen as not utilizing any of that, and we aren't you know, mining oil off of the uh, ocean floor, uh, then I guess, uh, you know... <laughs> Hoping that governments will follow their own laws, uh, then you know right. they have no they have no uh, prerogative to actually come out there and do anything about it. So and that's not the difference. create new ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so so it'll it's so it's it's definitely different. There's not going to be any asking for permission from yeah. from governments. I like that. Uh, it's yeah. So that that's that's the main difference, and that's what was so appealing to to, to me about it. Because uh, you know it's uh, it's always sketchy when you have to rely upon a nation state, right, or a country. Because uh, governments aren't very nice, <laughs> as I'm sure your listeners are very well aware. Yeah, yeah. And there's been some there's some interesting sort of success stories of people or of uh, sp- special economic zones that have done bet a lot better than others by somehow getting you know the government's permission to have lower taxes and have their own areas like uh, Singapore and areas like that that are are better right. off but it, anything well, that's really pushing toward liberty is probably going to be seen as a much a greater danger than uh, thank you for giving us less rules see right, you know right cuz i mean it could but they could also use that as something like a tax haven or something, you know, and it, as long as it stays small and doesn't start competing for uh, for people moving there, uh, doesn't start competing for people's attention in terms of business and investments and things like that, um, as long as it just remains a place where people can sink their money, the elites might be totally okay with that, so... You know, I, I I think it all depends on how much the elites can use it as to whether or not they'll allow it to exist. But that's me, and I'm a cynical pessimist. So well, I, I mean, so so I, I yeah, I agree with you to to a certain point. I like to I'd like to uh, bring up Erwin Erwin Strauss here, who back in the mid 20th century was kind of the 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 authority, and I mean that just kind of like he was the he was the expert. Um, yeah. on these on these various new libertarian you know country projects and uh, he wrote a really good book how to start your own country and i would recommend uh, if any of your listeners are interested in uh seasteading or you know i guess libertarian country building uh that is a terrific book to start with uh at the end of the book he has about 150 case studies that he looks into uh as to you know various projects i didn't know there that there were that many of them yeah uh, but awesome. Ir- Irwin strauss says something really interesting and uh, I, I tend to agree with him that uh, established countries and nation states, the, I guess the, the great powers, as he calls them, um, they, will, they, they want to keep the number of countries down because, you know, that, 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 that continues the status quo. So I think any attempt at founding new libertarian countries, regardless of the intention, regardless of the, of the size and scale, 
uh, nation states and countries don't like that because it, it's, it's, they, they, have, they have control as it is. They don't want, uh, you know, I guess, other, other variables added to the equation. Uh, so I think that was a really interesting thing that he brought up because uh, nations, you know, obviously nation states hate competition. They hate the free market, right? So, uh, <laughs> so I guess it kind of makes sense in that realm too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, the 150 case studies is pretty fascinating. Just that number. Is a well, and, and I guess let me. I guess let me just add a, a caveat there. They aren't all, I guess, like new libertarian country projects. Yeah, I um, but the, I mean, there's a lot of different variety. But they're like, this is something that's that's not new. Uh, it's more kind of uh, there's there's a I guess a, a relatively big uh, micro nation movement uh, back in the 20th century. So smaller new nations. Uh, so it's it's just a really interesting you know realm of investigation, which has kind of been my focus for the past year, and. Uh, and it's it's really awesome to see some of these projects. Even though I I don't think I don't think uh, they're really going to pan out the way the uh, uh, the people who are running the project think it's going to. But uh, regardless, so you know I, I like I like to see I like to see the shift away from political crusading uh, into you know even 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 strategies that are you know probably not going to work. Uh, I'm glad to see that that shift into uh, you know direct action. Yeah, it certainly helps get the creative juices flowing and people thinking in a different direction and thinking about various ways that they might act in that to create liberty more quickly without relying on the state. Uh, yeah, like you're saying, I've heard a few interviews of people with CSET studying and stuff. I haven't read a book on it yet or looked into it that much, but I haven't, they don't seem to have a very definitive uh, profit plan, which I think will end up being, quite problematic. It doesn't seem like something that at this point is a really good investment. So then raising right. the capital necessary in order to seastead at such a large scale is going to be very difficult. And it's relying on donations in, in even with some profit, but using, using a lot of donation money just is not going to do it. Yeah, these projects cost a lot of money, guys. <laughs> they yeah. cost a lot of money. Well, you're living uh, on the ocean. Of of course, it costs a lot of money. It's right. That's that's a pretty insane thing to try to figure out how to do, especially at a significant scale. Yeah, yeah, and I, I guess I guess two points real quick. And again, this is one reason I like the Marinia project, you know, uh, so much is that uh, in the Kaysal Bank, that's a very highly traveled area. So so Marinia could act as a I guess a port, you could say. Uh, where there would be a lot of trade going through the area, so that's automatically right there, uh, you know, profit like a, you know some uh, availability for profit, uh, and then also too, I mean, uh, there was talk of you know like it would it would be really easy to fish farm there. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, harvest. Uh, I think it was like harvest seaweed because there are a lot of people that uh, you know use seaweed for nutritional uh, purposes now. Yeah. Uh, there there are there are quite a few out there in the Kaysal Bank, uh, quite a few profit uh, potentials. Um, but yeah. yeah, the funding is the funding is always is always the hard part. Uh, it really is. It's uh, you know the CSA Institute's running into that to a certain extent, um, but I, I, and this is where kind of the unique case study comes in. I'm sure you guys heard of uh, you've, you've heard of Roger Ver from Bitcoin.com, uh, yeah. so-called Bitcoin Jesus. Uh, he's planning on uh, doing a, a new country project too. Uh, he's not calling it a country, it's, it's, it, but but he is trying to uh, he is trying to do that. Uh, he wants to actually purchase land outright from an established you know government. Um, nice. and what's, and what's different about their project is he already has, uh, you know, a lot of people are made millionaires by cryptocurrency. So they already, he already had, or they, the, him and the free society foundation already have a hundred million dollars yeah, to go into that project. That's a great, so that's, great place to start huge. for sure. Right, right. So, I mean, I, I saw that and I'm, you know, Erwin Strauss talked about, you know, why would, why would the, why would a government, you know, not just, uh. Uh, it's kind of like the, I guess, the non-libertarian drug dealer. If he can get the money and the drugs, why wouldn't he do that? Uh, so with a nation state, uh, especially if there's not going to be any defense, why wouldn't the established country, just as soon as the check clears, uh, so to speak, why wouldn't they just, you know, take the money and the land? Uh, because uh, there's only so much land on Earth, and uh, governments to just sell it outright uh, is not very likely. Rather, what will probably happen uh, in negotiations is they'll get like a 99-year lease or something, because the then the nation state can uh, obtain sovereignty but still, you know, make money off of, uh, you know, that, uh, that venture. So I, I've got some concerns there, but, the, but immediately the funding, they've already got $100 million. Uh, and that's without any, yeah. you know, private donations like from, from just, the, I guess, the public. So uh, they're, they're a step ahead, but uh, some concerns for sure. 
Well, yeah, you know, I mean, in is. terms of these sorts of projects, you need an anti-Somalia, I think. You need an example of what happens if, um, if anarchy thrives. You need an example of what happens when you have less or no government and it does extremely well compared to governed states. So, like, pe- w- when people say, well, why don't you move to Somalia? Well, I'd rather go build a house in the Marinia project. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. yeah. That, that's yeah. That's that's true. And that's one. That's one thing I've I've always kind of touted, or I guess said that it would be a great benefit for you know libertarians and anarchists if one of these I guess free society, free not really free societies, but free areas. Uh, I guess uh, maybe coercion free zones at least to a certain extent. Yeah. And when they come into fruition, like if it's if it's Marinia, if it's uh, you know some if it's something else, if it's uh, you know the Free Society Foundation's uh, you know version, whatever, I don't care what it is. The point is that uh, they can be a de- a very good demonstration uh, of of laissez faire and how effective it is when uh, you know this uh, this this new this so called new country is thriving and uh, you know quickly becoming one of the most profitable. And uh, then uh, you know kind of the the status the the communists and the socialists have to kind of take a second look and say, huh. Okay, maybe we're wrong about all this. Uh, so, so yeah, firsthand, firsthand, real world experience, I think, is is really, really good, and that's something that's uh, uh, Rayo, who was a freedom pioneer in the 1960s. That's something he said, uh, in, in his book, uh, when he proposed kind of the uh, sovereign freeport uh, sort of scenario. He said, yeah, he said that you know this is a great demonstration of laissez faire if it can come to fruition. Yeah, absolutely. Be interesting to see how many. Or if any big companies or what various banks might pop up in an area like a non-nation of Roger Ver, just to see what a tax-free zone would look like and what the import-export deals would look like with various nation states. Your uh, the concerns you you brought up or that we all I think have about the seasteading and buying a piece of land all have to do with. The, the fact that states exist it's inter- it, it really exactly. uh, it highlights the the importance still of changing hearts and minds and uh yeah yeah it, out, it, it does you, you need more people to oppose aggression and even even state aggression so that these things are much less problematic once you get to a, a sort of critical mass of of individuals uh, you know a, a few hundred million perhaps or probably less I think you'll be able to form these these uh, places of freedom and secure them more assuredly, even against the yeah. states. Yeah, and and that's that's funny too, and it kind of just you know shows another contradiction within the minds of status is that uh, you know you just kind of mentioned it you know uh, uh, mentioned it a few moments ago that oh if you don't like it in America then leave it's like I'm trying dang it <laughs> you won't let me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the contradictions with status never end. I, there's a bunch of contradictions within myself that are still there, probably uh, hanging about in but, my head and, that I haven't realized yet. And just to clarify, it's not just communists and socialists that have a lot to learn. The right, and the especially the GOP, the Tea Party kind of thing, they have a lot to learn too, which it, like basically uh, their wet dream of, of a country, which is the USA... Um, that was basically a bait and switch to a different ruler. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's all the same shit, different day, you know? Right. Yeah. So yeah, the fascists too, sure. Toss, toss them in there as well. Um, yeah, yeah, without, without mercantilist trade policies, uh, you know, everyone will be poor. Uh, yeah, certainly a sovereign free poor sort of thing could, uh, could, could prove the, uh, the, the, the complete wrongness of such an idea. Yeah. And well, and also, of course, the idea that you can start a government and have it respect the rights to property because, like, you know, Whiskey Rebellion, Civil War, yeah. Lysander Spooner's Postal Service that got shut down, all of these little, you know, really easy, huge examples to point to of the government not giving a fuck about human rights, even if it's the, you know, God blessed U.S. government, which we should all be praying to. Um, you Absolutely. know, and worshiping that, at football. Yeah. Games. Yeah. Or in the voting booth by please, please give me a different life. Um, Save you me. know, yeah. Right. So the Smallville theme plays in the background. Um, I just, <laughs> I just, uh, you know, I'm very cynical about, about how 
you know, different the the parties are. You know, a communist has their particular little, little snowflake bullshit to vent, and and you know, a Republican does too. Like Ron Paul even said it recently. Uh, he said the snowflake moniker is often used to refer to people who are easily offended by just about everything, unable to accept or acknowledge free will. These snowflakes attempt to use bully tactics and even government legislation to try to force people to think and act in a certain way. It's more of an annoyance than anything else. Free will still reigns supreme. No amount of legislation can change that. We're still naturally free to form our own opinions and act on them. While the snowflake designation has usually been reserved for people on the left side of the political spectrum, we may be seeing the emergence of snowflakes on the right as well. Apparently, many people on the right are offended by athletes or anyone else not standing up in front of the American flag while the national anthem is playing. Unable to acknowledge free will, they attempt to use bully tactics to try and force people to act a certain way. And so, you know, I mean... And it's not just that. It's always pretty much been that, you know, stomp my flag, I'll stomp your ass. That sort of bullshit, you know? Like, so it's not just the left that that needs a hard-fought lesson in why the fuck you don't, shouldn't, like, beg for coddling. Because if it's not a communist or socialist government, it's going to be a GOP government that, uh, that, that will, that will violate somebody else's rights. And as long as your rights aren't being violated right now, that's, that's the only thing that matters to the, to the GOP, to the neocons, to the tea party, to the left, uh, social justice warriors, Alinskyites, uh, fucking, you know, yeah, (laughs) I just, you know, all those people are basically the same. They just want different rights violated than the other groups. So they have to ease them up a little bit every time they incrementally fuck us over. Yeah. And the anarchist is, well, how about we just don't violate anyone's rights? Isn't right. that better? <laughs> this is but guys, you have to in order to live in a civilized, so- civilized society. Yes, right? in order to live <laughs> in a civilized society, we have to be barbaric toward one another through the state. Perfectly mm-hmm. reasonable. All right, we, somebody has to do it. I'm gonna, Damn it! I'm going to bring us to survival and prepping very quickly, since that was because one of the main topics. We all know we that gonna society really is going to die. So, I mean, that's what we should be preparing for. The, st- the state will die, at least. I'm I'm hopeful that many elements of society will remain. Shane, I have like a bag of peanuts in my cabinet. Am I fucked? That's the extent of my prepping. <laughs> so, so your 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 food store situation is just a bag of peanuts. Well, yeah, you're gonna be good on protein. Mostly, for, for mostly a, a bag of, of peanuts. Yeah, I have. I also have a bunch of meat that will go bad in a few days. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you would you would uh, inevitably be very very reliant upon grocery stores, and uh, as with uh, have, you know the rest, the rest, I have two cats. Two- so. You know, okay, in, so a couple in an meals, emergency, couple meals there. yeah, a couple of meals. <laughs> cat burgers. Yeah, my grandpa told me stories when he he was in World War II. He told me stories about how they ate cat burgers. So yeah, I guess yeah, you could do that, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, you'd be very reliant upon uh, grocery stores, as with uh, you know the rest of the survival society, and I think you'd run into some 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 problems very quickly. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know if you know if that if that's the situation that you find yourself in, just make sure you have uh, you know a means of self defense because. Uh, I mean, you've seen uh, <laughs> you, you've seen people, uh, you know, on Black Friday, just, you know, doing crazy stuff over just uh, for a TV. Just imagine if there's actually a real situation because uh, which, you know, I, I w- that wouldn't be my rec- my actual recommendation. My actual recommendation would be, you know, food storage doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be difficult. Uh, and there are a lot of models out there uh, that you kind of uh, go off of today. So uh, Vanu, right? <laughs> Va- Vanu, well, actually, Va- yeah, Vanu is Vanu is interesting. They, these uh, these folks actually kind of pioneered survivalism. Uh, back in the uh, back in the sixties, uh, but yeah, uh, survivalism <laughs> well, is definitely think, one one aspect. I think aspect first of, humans um, kind of pioneered survivalism. <laughs> These dudes might have well, just right, picked okay, up on it a little bit. F- fair enough, but sur- survivalism as we as we kind of know it today, with with this yeah. with this massive market that's that's kind of grown out of like the food storage, you know, Patriot Supply, e Foods Direct, places like that. Uh, you know, that wasn't available back. <laughs> that wasn't available back in the sixties. So Rayo and uh, other wilderness Venuans had to. Be very creative with their uh, with their food storage situation, but uh, you know, luckily today with with technology advanced to the way it is, we don't have to you know kind of live in that primitive kind of state. Yeah, absolutely. So g- give us 
we're get, we're trying to wrap it up in like ten minutes. I try to keep this solid because I got things to do. But can you give us like three simple things that you think are the most important things to do for uh, prepping? Or do you have yeah, like a, the- you know something like that? Some some a few really practical sort of easy things or as easy as they can be. be well, simple. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I would recommend having, you know, kind of a, at least a two week supply, uh, two week supply of food. If you can, fi- I, hopefully you can, you can fit in a bug out bag. Uh, it depends upon how big your backpack is and how, uh, how strong, uh, or how strong you are and how, how much you can carry in that backpack. Um, uh, but certainly some sort of a, uh, some, some sort of a bug out bag, uh, with two weeks supply of food. Uh, typically I think, I think most of the kits are, you know, maybe three or four days, which I don't think that's long enough by any by any by any means. Uh, as soon as you do get in a situation where you might need them, uh, where you might where you might need it, you'll often immediately, within just a couple of days, start worrying about how you're going to get your next meal. Uh, so two weeks uh, can can you know, give you a little more uh, peace of mind, uh, and I, I guess uh, uh, in figuring out what you're going to do next. Uh, so obviously a bug out bag with with some food storage uh, in the bug out bag. Uh, obviously, you know, some sort of a, uh, if, if you, if you don't want to, you know, construct, uh, a, a, a shelter with uh, native materials, if you're going to be bugging out in the woods, then, uh, you know, some sort of a really small tent, um, would be, uh, would, would certainly be, certainly be good. Uh, beyond that, uh, I mean, just, I would say, you know, kind of rope, rope can come in handy in a lot of situations. Uh, uh cordage. Cordage, cordage, yeah, I would say rope, yeah, cordage. Um, so those those would be a, those would be a couple of things. Uh, uh, Jeremy and I talked about uh, um, last time we chatted about uh, kind of like something like the uh, the live straw, uh, to some sort of something to uh, you know pu- uh, purify and clean your water. Yeah. Because uh, water's water's important too. Uh, water's oh. important too. But uh, right, I mean, <laughs> yeah. If if you're unaware, guys, water is uh, you know, water is kind of important. Water's uh, good. Okay. <laughs> but I, I guess, yeah. When when Jeremy and I were talking uh, last uh, last time, uh, if for 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 a, if you're going to be bugging out and you kind of already have those plans in place, uh, I would go ahead and just choose a bug out location if at all possible that already has a good water supply, like a spring or a well or something like that. Uh, because if you don't have to worry about water, that's a, a pretty that's that's pretty incredible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy lives in the desert, so he's kind of screwed. Uh. Yeah, I have to. I have to. I have to go on a trek to where there is civilization in form of, you know, like rudimentary societies before before I can do anything. Um, that and that means that reasonably, I probably should uh, should make a lot of solar stills and that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Got to go. Yeah. Got to adapt to your environment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I or guess a, a couple of really far. <laughs> that too that too and i guess well, yeah of... but I, I sort of don't want to be unethical even in a survival situation and i don't own a car right now so i would have to uh i would have to steal one and i don't think i want to do that i think i want to be one of the people that isn't like becoming a madman just because there's no government i kind of want to prove the statists wrong yeah i agree fair enough fair enough maybe yeah. i'll uh yeah. i don't know i'm i'm kind of thinking about uh prepping and i'm thinking i might just try to gain a lot of fat do you think that is a helpful alternative to a two-week supply of food uh well that that is something that that rayo that rayo talked about so he yeah. said be, be be skeptical about people who say that they've gone and lived two weeks out in the uh, out in the wilderness uh they didn't because uh, and he, he called it the slob society uh because folks in the slob society have a lot of fat and that's probably what they were you know uh living off of so yeah for yeah. for a couple of weeks probably yeah that might uh certainly might help you but uh, once that fat starts to get eaten, eaten off you better uh uh, figure out a, a different alternative. Well, and also eat lots of high fat foods in general because your body will metabolize that quickly and it'll turn into energy more quickly. Uh, like, you know, basically go out in the wilderness and have the wilderness equivalent to the bulletproof lifestyle with lots of brain octane oils. Sure. Right. Sure. That's, that sounds, that sounds feasible. Yeah. All right. L- last question, just cause I'm curious what your answer is. What do you think the, what do you think the most likely scenario is to make survivalism and prepping become necessary for the average American citizen? 
So you saw you're saying like what what's what situation or scenario would come about that would make you know make prepping uh, prepping or survivalism necessary? Yeah, yeah, that where I'd have to use the bug out bag. What do you think is the most likely cause of that? Most likely cause. Uh, a lot of people have been fearful of nuclear wars. I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not. Uh, you know, too concerned about uh, something like that. Uh, that would eliminate a lot of uh, a lot of uh, tax. Uh, uh, you know, tax slaves, and the state needs kind of needs uh, kind of needs those. Um, I'd say probably probably. Well, I mean, that is if you're not talking about the elites that like respect the Georgia Guidestones and want to see a breakaway civilization of you know elitists living underground while the fallout settles uh, from the population culling down to five hundred thousand. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, so I, I, I'm not too not too worried about that one. I would yeah. say probably the most uh, probably the most realistic one is something we've seen so much of in uh, the past month: natural disasters. Uh, okay. especially with uh, yeah. with hurricanes that would make it very I mean yeah they're finding out firsthand that uh, you know especially in Puerto Rico that uh, they're they're relying upon uh, you know food being imported into the country food and water and all the supplies that they need uh, and with with you know food specifically or just uh, you know prepping and survivalism they're in a world of hurt and right. uh, and if they would have uh, I mean uh, I, I, there, I, there's really no good uh, outcome to, to a situation like that but if you have your your basic necessities at hand, uh, it'll make things a lot easier, and you won't be completely dependent upon, uh, you know, the state to uh, to to make sure that you survive. Uh, so I would say natural disasters are easily easily the the situation where where prepping and prepping and survivalism becomes very practical, and uh, the demonization of survivalism and prep or survivalists and preppers uh, really. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and when when it, the, for those who prepped in those situations, yeah, they were smart. We're talking crap about them. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, the demonization of prepping is not because they don't think that that stuff might happen. It's because they want to make anybody who se seems to be prepping for extremes seem ridiculous so that they can push the status quo as something that's feasible and also desirable. If they can get people to stay on the same page instead of like moving to you know to to one or the other extreme in terms of survivalism in terms of like preparing for the the worst to, to come to worst, then they can make it seem as though the worst will never come to worst, no matter what anybody tells you. And that's the sort of propaganda that keeps people asleep and pacified. So fuck those people. Even uh, yeah. outside of the uh, propaganda, I don't have evidence for this, but I, th I think there's some truth to it. I think a lot of people choose to shame sort of per survivalists and uh, preppers or talk about how ridiculous it is because it helps them deal with their own insecurity of being so underprepared and they they makes them feel more safe if they along with everyone else can talk about how ridiculous these people are who will be okay if something insane happens and they can just it helps them assume that it this probably won't happen at all so i don't need to be worried about it Right, yeah, and and that comes with with any any lifestyle that's not uh, that's not typical. So whether whether that is survivalism, survivalism and prepping, or whether it's van nomadism or minimal sailboating or whatever it is, uh, or those even lifestyles like learning are... things like that, like you know, guns, um, right. how to how to make rudimentary devices of certain sorts, uh, martial arts, any sort of thing like that, where you're preparing for a society that they don't think exists anymore. Yeah, and, and and with all of those things, you're you're take you're taking personal responsibility, and that's something that the uh, the state of survival society, mainstream society, uh, lacks to a large degree. So yeah, uh, so there's a, I think there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of projecting there, uh, and a lot of uh, har uh, you know and a lot of a harshness and vitriol just because people are taking initiative themselves, uh, uh, themselves for whatever purpose. And I think that's exactly. more demonstrative of the, of, the, of the the mainstream society than it is of uh, any individual survivalist or prepper or anybody like that. Yeah. Yeah. I I definitely agree. It's it's amazing how big an, of an aversion people have to even a 30 minutes of buying prepping stuff on Amazon that'll last you 25 years and cost Well, the you real know, amazing like, thing is people's aversion to reality. Yeah. All right. We got we got to get out of here. I have to get out of here. My wife gives me <laughs> yeah. a very <laughs> a, a limited hour. So Shane, do you want to plug your stuff? 
Yeah, sure, sure. <clears throat> so the the main uh, web the, the main podcast I do I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Uh, Liberty Under Attack. Uh, there we talk about, uh, uh, it's typically based around direct action, you know, taking the initiative yourself and finding your own freedom without uh, begging those who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers. Nice. Uh, that would be uh, Liberty Under Attack. Yeah, mostly direct action, uh, some philosophy in there, uh, some economics, that sort of good, that sort of good stuff. Uh, the second podcast I do, which I started in January of this year, uh, the Vanu podcast. Uh, I mentioned Vanu and Rayo a couple of times in this discussion. Yeah. And uh, uh, that podcast is devoted to those ideas. So just real briefly, uh, Vanu is simply a, a, an awkward contraction of voluntary and not vulnerable. Uh, it's premised around the inv becoming as invulnerable to coercion uh, as you possibly can, and that's both from public coercers, the state, and private coercers, criminals. Uh, so that's the, the basic premise and, and the strategies that Rail uh, you know, lays out uh, are derived from, from that, uh, that basic principle. Uh, so that would be Vani, the uh, Vani uh, If you're interested in the survivalism stuff, I mean, definitely check out uh, check out uh, the episode we did on food storage. It's very long, but uh, right. it's uh, <laughs> it was we went to a lot of a lot of depth on the subject. And uh, the last one I, I did until a couple of weeks ago, the Marinia podcast. If you're interested in learning more about that, uh, or if any of your listeners have a lot of money and they want to, uh, you know, help support, help <laughs> help help bring it into fruition. Uh, I mean, it's on hold, but uh, you know, everything's still in place. If uh, something like that does come about, uh, Marinia.org, uh, you can find uh, the podcast there, the business plan, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that would be uh, those would be that would be uh, kind of the all, all the work that I do. Sweet. Well, thanks a lot for joining us, and, Shane. And uh, just leave a link to anything you want us to do in the chat, by the way. Okay, yeah, for, for show notes. Yeah, I can do that. Not a problem. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Harding, anything you want to say? Uh, you well, uh, obviously, you know, if you want to join the Third Reich of Anarchy, you can do that. I started an anarchist group on furryspeech.com, <laughs> uh, and so... The yeah, uh, it's 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 the biggest joke. The powerful um, furry community. Yeah. Um, then um, then you can head over there. Also, I'm about to do possibly about to join a live stream with Porpoiseful Discussion. Other than that, uh, you can check me out on moment uh, uh, on ipmnation.com and journalisticrevolution.com. Moment of rage. And you can also follow me at Insanity is Free pretty much fucking everywhere because that's a um, fairly polarizing username and I'm the only one with it. S uh, smash the state, uh, fight the motherfuckers. Yeah, sounds good. All right, y'all. Don't follow me anywhere or pay attention to anything I do. Thanks for joining us today. Have a good one. Love your neighbor. Hate the state. Peace. <laughs>